we're very lucky to have someone with Frank's knowledge um, come and, and speak uh, with people today. Obviously, there's some information on the screen about Frank. Um, I don't know if Frank really wants me to talk about dates because I probably make him feel a little bit older. But in 2001, that he, he um, joined the Heinz team. 2004, he became a, a partner in the Heinz organisation. The great thing about Heinz is they really specialise in the management rights industry, body corporate and management rights. So they know what they're talking about. Frank here knows what he's talking about because he gets to sit on a lot of um, boards and also different uh, industry um, committees and provides advice. So if people are asking for him for advice at that level, we all know that the advice is, is quality and we also know that he knows what he's talking about. So as I said, we're very lucky today to have him as um, part of our, our um, series of um, seminars. Um, one of the things that Frank he always shines away from it, but it does say the best lawyers in Australia 2018, 2019. I think that's an amazing achievement, Frank. Well done on that, okay? Um, before I go any further, I'm going to hand you over to, to Frank and get him to start going through the presentation. I think I've reviewed it, I've had a look at it. All the things that are in there today are very useful. It's just a matter of asking your question today, are you marketing yourself correctly? If you are, make a checklist, check off that you're doing each of these things or go home and start making a change as of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Scott. Um, so this, uh, for me, and I don't know why we have that disclaimer, because there is nothing I'm going to talk about today that's legal. I'm going to stay right away from legislation and that sort of thing, um, because that's what you can pay me or someone else for. You don't need to know what section 123 of the BCCM Act actually says. What you need to know is what makes your business better and what you can do about that. So um, this happened, um, so I, back one step. The, for those of you that were here at the last presentation I did about solving body corporate disputes, that was one off the cuff that I enjoy doing. This is another one that I've never done before, but I think is super important for people in management rights. So it started as a marketing yourself in management rights. So I came back from Christmas holidays all enthused, uh, emailed Justin and said, right, we should do this. Uh, and said, what date do you want to do? I said, somewhere towards, you know, late March and then suddenly it's here. So panicking away early this week, coming up with the slides and what I was actually going to talk about. Um, and it, more than anything else, it's not so much um, marketing yourself in management rights, it's how to make your management rights business stronger. And you do that by marketing. So slide through these. So yeah, so today's really about making your business stronger by building great business relationships and positioning yourself as the go-to person in your building. So those for me are the most important things. And in a sense, what I'm trying to do is put myself out of a job here. So if my day-to-day -day was purely dealing with people that were buying and selling management rights businesses and varying their agreements and extending them, that would be great. Without contest, without fights. A lot of my day-to-day, -day, and certainly the distressed clients I get, um, come in because of disputes. So that last session we did uh, was about solving some of those things. Um, and today is going to be really more of that. So this isn't necessarily building great relationships with your committee and your strata manager, as much as those are important, and maybe that's a separate slide, a separate presentation, but it's building great business relationships with your owners. That's what today is about. And that to me, uh, because ultimately, no matter what your committee does and no matter what they want to do, they are beholden to the owners. So they can say they want to do certain things, they can uh, go militant, they can join organisations, they can do whatever they want, but ultimately, every 12 months comes the chance for them to be held accountable. They are all effectively voted out at the AGM and then they can re-nominate and go back in and they are accountable to the owners for the decisions they make. So if you have great relationships with the owners, in effect, that's a way to hold the committee to account. Um, and in effect, it would be great if we had that with our political system, but we don't. So you've actually got more control over this than you do elsewhere. So Scott, I might just... Am I just sliding through? Dun, dun, dun. Hang on, here we go. I'll make it work. Um, now, when it comes to... It's just not moving through on those slides. Let's see what's coming. You can figure that out. Um, businesses. The more I bounce around and the more I talk to people, the more 
each business has the same characteristics. So we actually provide, we're in the same business. What we're in the business of is providing professional services to people. So mine relate to a legal context. I provide legal advice. Um, for you guys, more than anything else, it's caretaking side of things. So what you are is providing caretaking services or facility management services to your body corporate. And that's as simple as mowing, mowing lawns, maintaining gardens and grounds, et cetera, et cetera. It's procuring contracts. Which one is sliding to the right? Yeah. Perfect, thanks mate. Um, and it's managing all of those things for your body corporate and hopefully in a very professional context. From a letting side of things then, it's providing property management services to your owners and doing that in a professional way, um, which is the same as what we have to do in terms of providing services to our clients. So all of us are in the business of providing services. And one of the things I think with management rights that I bang on about endlessly um, is that, and Trevor Rawnsley says this all the time, management rights is possibly the worst word because what it implies is you've got some form of special privilege or you've got some specific degree of control. Um, in one way you do in terms of the tenure of your contracts, you know, you're going to have a caretaking agreement and a letting agreement that run for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, whatever it might be. Um, and that's certainly from a caretaking perspective, but from a letting perspective, in a sense, you've only got 30 days more security than what I do with respect to contracts. All of my clients, all of my business can come to an end with an email from a client saying, you know what, Frank, I don't want to act, you to act, me, act for me anymore, and I'm done. Nothing I can do. So that same thing applies to you in a letting sense. And that's, um, you know, 30 days notice without cause and away you go. So while a body corporate can't change what your contract says, um, you still need to make sure that you're providing services. And I think probably for me, the best type of mentality to have is that work on the basis that it could come to an end tomorrow. Not that it will, and don't get me wrong, that's why these things are worth the multipliers that people pay for them. Uh, but if you had that mindset, you will continually deliver and outperform. And one of the other things that comes with all of our businesses is that um, we don't necessarily um, always win with our clients. There are gonna be people you deal with that you don't like dealing with, that don't want to listen to what you tell them. Uh, we get it all the time as well, you know, like for me, the analogy sort of that I've used repeatedly is, what's the point of paying me to give advice if you're not gonna to listen to it? But ultimately, that's your prerogative. You're the client, I tell you what the legal position is, I tell you what you could do, probably sometimes what you should do, and if you choose not to listen to it, that's your prerogative. And you're gonna have the same thing with respect to your committees and your owners. People are not necessarily gonna take your recommendations. That might be with respect to the replacement of a pool filter. It might be purely managing an owner around what the rental income for their unit is. You know, in a market where things might be going backwards, they've been getting 400 bucks a week for the last two years and suddenly the market's at 380. No, no, I want 400. Well, that's nice, but that's not realistic. And then they leave the unit vacant for eight weeks while they chase that mythical 400 and lose 380 bucks a week while they're doing it. Um, sometimes you can't control that. And the worst words I think you can probably use in all of our businesses are, I told you so. It just doesn't help. So there's gonna come times where you just have to suck it up. And that's, again, one of the realities of management rights, but that's one of the realities of business. It'd be great to go around being right all the time and telling people that they've got it wrong, but it just doesn't advance your cause. So again, last slide, or last session was about picking the fights you need to. They're the ones you don't need to have. You've just got to continually to manage people. Now, um, this is a bit topical. So Game of Thrones fans, um, we're, we're on again, so I think probably the last session we did, this is March 2019. Um, new series coming. In theory, uh, um, Game of Thrones had the wall to protect them from raiders. Uh, they got destroyed at the end of the last episode. Um, but no business has the wall. I would love to think that once you were a client of mine, you could not leave. I'd love to put up a barrier and stop anyone else offering the services that I offer, but that's not realistic. And that's the same with you. So um, I did an ARAMA training session uh, two weeks ago and did the usual question and answer at the end and um, someone put their hand up and said, oh, I've been told that body corporate managers are gonna start renting units. So they're gonna go from um, just doing the strata management services to renting units in buildings. And 
First thing I said is I think that's complete rubbish. Their job is hard enough as it is, and I'm not aware of any single one of them that would want to do that. It, they, they've got enough on their plate as it is. Um, but the second thing is, so what? How are they any different from Ray Ride or LJ Hooker or whoever it is that's going to come and knock on your owner's doors? It's just another service provider. And what today is about, um, so I'm setting the scene here, is what you can try to do to stop people from shifting from you. And that's by building relationship with them and how you do that. So you've always got to be aware that there is going to be competition. And there is no way to stop that competition. And the best way to actually preserve the value of your business and maintain it is to have bloody good relationships with the people you're acting for. And again, that doesn't mean you're best friends. It doesn't mean you invite them over for Christmas lunch. It means you provide excellent service and you position yourself as being the go-to person all the time. Because you have something in common with all of your clients. You're all interested in what the properties in your building are renting for and are worth. No one's invested in property hoping to lose money. They want to be reassured. They want to know what's going on. And you are in the prime position to provide that information. So, um, and probably the thing that is always the case in management rights, and I say it to everyone, the biggest commercial risk in management rights is the loss of units from your rental pool. That is going to happen. And that's not going to happen because of things you do wrong. Go back um, when I was starting out in management rights generally, uh, Mike Butler, who started RAS and is now effectively retired from RAS, um, back then, before we had uh, emails on our phones and all the connectivity we've got these days, this is probably the early 2000s, there would be peaks and troughs in terms of busyness. And back then, work used to come in by virtue of the phone ringing. Phone would ring, you didn't know who the number was, you hope it's a client at the end of the line needing what you sell. Um, and there would be times when it would get really slow. And I wish I knew what caused that to happen, um, because if you go back two weeks, probably um, I reckon I sent out more quotes and landed more new deals in a week than I've done in my entire management rights career. Just there was probably three or four a day. So I don't know what dam burst somewhere, but transactions just came from everywhere. And then in a month's time, I won't get one for the entire week. So I don't know what it is. I do know that federal elections slow things down. So the moment that starter's gun is fired, no one will do anything. Um, and interestingly enough, I had a, um, a, a deck at home getting sanded and tidied up and I was having a chat to the guy doing that. How's business, mate? Yeah, really good, blah, 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 but it'll slow down soon. He said, why is that? He said, the election. So people stop sanding decks during an election. It's just bizarre. So, um, but and troughs, I don't know what caused it. So at one stage in a moment of, um, I suppose fear, lack of confidence. What have I done wrong? Have I done something to piss the whole industry off? I don't know. Um, I was talking to Mike and said, mate, what's happening? He said, Frank, this just happens. But the good news, and this is what the context of this slide is, is that people will be forced to do things with their property that they don't want to do because of any number of circumstances. They might divorce. They might have a tax bill they haven't paid. They might want to retire. They might want to sell it and buy a management rights business. I mean, if you go back to all of you that are potentially in the industry, you probably all did something with property before you actually bought. You either sold the house you're in, uh, before banks tightened up the screws, you might have geared against the existing properties that you owned and used that as equity or used that as collateral to borrow more to buy these businesses. But everything we do is hinged to property. And people will be forced to sell property, whether they want to or not in circumstances of their choosing, sometimes they might get a job transfer. Who knows? But the reality is that if those units are in your rental pool, you are potentially going to lose them through circumstances beyond your control. And again, today is about how to manage that. So the good news is this. So um, for those of you that weren't here last time, I play as much golf as I can, not as much as I'd like to. Uh, I've got a mate, I do a lot of early rounds. The best thing about summer for me is teeing off at quarter to five in the morning. You can do 18 holes on foot in two and a half hours and be at work, happy days. Might be a little bit tired come nine o'clock at night, but you're done. Um, so I found a mate that likes doing that. We're knocking around and finally, after how many rounds, sort of said, what do you actually do? And we're just talking golf. And so he's actually the head of um, data and analytics for a listed retailer in Australia. So um, his job, with his team of 30 people is to decide how much of the $100 million a year they've got to spend on marketing goes where. So Google, 
catalogues, TV, radio, newspapers, um, car races, whatever it is. His job is to try to get that right and analyse where the clients are coming from across Australia and New Zealand, which is a little bit terrifying because if he gets it wrong and they spend 20 million where they shouldn't spend 20 million, what actually happens? So, and what catalogues they drop where? And what time of year they drop them? Is it when people get tax returns? It's all this sort of stuff. So that's their attempt in that business to find their clients. And without doubt, he's looking over his shoulder at Amazon, who if you're a retailer in Australia would be terrifying at this point in time. For me, um, it's obviously nowhere near as expensive as that, um, but part of my job is to find clients. All of you are either clients or potential clients, so I'm doing what I need to do to get here. Time out of the office, cost us a hiring fee, whatever it might be, happy days. Um, but back to when I started out um, in management rights, when I was that little bright-eyed, bushy-tailed thing that didn't understand all the pain that comes with running a business, is every single client um, had a relationship somewhere else. And back then, before I was doing these sort of things and before we had email and before we had Google, even, like the amount of work we get off Google is terrifying, terrifyingly good, the only way to get referrals was from brokers. So you need to be friends with brokers or accountants or banks. And all of those people had existing relationships. So all I could do was go and try to meet everyone and be the first port of call when whoever their existing relationship was didn't deliver. And that's 17 years later, here I am. You know, happy days, it's been a slog. But that was me trying to find clients then. But when you come to you guys, your clients are each of the owners of lots in your building. You don't have to spend a cent to find them. You are entitled to the body corporate role. If you own a unit in your building, you are entitled to that body corporate role. Don't for a second believe the Privacy Act stuff that someone might try to give you in terms of not giving you that information. You are entitled to it. As an owner, you are entitled to it. You're entitled to the names and addresses of every owner. If you're not an owner of a lot in your scheme, you might need to ask a favour of your strata manager or you ask a favour of one of the owners you act for to get a copy of the role. And off that, you need to, me, break that into these categories. The first people are, obviously, some of the most important people in your business, which are the investors you manage units for. They are gold. You know, and you, you tie back your capital value of your business to a large degree in terms of the revenue derived from it, which is based in large part on the letting appointments you hold with owners. So those are the people who are probably the most important people in your business. You want to look after them, you want to manage them, you want to love them, you want to provide them with all the services you can. Now next is these. And this is what you should be doing, is categorising inside your building what is where. Because certainly when we see every verification report, the accountants will say, you know, there's 100 units in the building, 50 in your rental pool, 20 are owner-occupied, you know, and I suppose, what's that, 30 are outside managed, outside slash self-managed. And you, of course, you don't, from a verification perspective, actually know what those other ones are because you can't see the arrangements that people have. But for me, in management rights always, those, that second group there is... Um, one of the easiest ways to add value to your business by bringing those into your rental pool. And again, back to when we're losing units, they're the ones that we should have as our primary targets to replace. Now, I do talk to clients over time, um, and I suppose this is why property management is a fairly um, sticky business, I suppose, in terms of, well, you know, just go get them back. Well, my clients tell me it's not that easy, Frank. They've chosen to go somewhere else for a reason. So for you guys, it's trying to understand what that reason is. So it might be that their brother owns LJ Hooker down the road, in which case they've got a cheap property management deal and they're sorted. It might be that they've done their own management for years and they don't want to pay a 7% fee for doing it. But it also could be because they don't know you provide the services. And for me, those are the people that you've got to treat yourself like I did when I started out in management rights 17 years ago and keep letting them know what you do because at some stage, someone may let them down. And when that someone lets them down in terms of if they're self-managed and they can't find a tradie to do what needs to be done, uh, if they're outside managed and they can't get a return phone call from their property manager, or even better, they can't find a tenant because no one cares, they turn to you. So that's not gonna be an immediate overnight thing. 
That will take time, it will take positioning, but you've got to keep chipping away. Um, of course, then the other two groups are these two, so probably that last one in terms of lockups. Unless you're in a short-term building, you might not have too many of those. If you're in a permanent rental, people live in their units, that's it. If you're in a holiday building, um, there may well be some of those units, so people come and go as they please, themselves, their family, friends, otherwise, um, and owner-occupiers. Now, the thing, again, with those last two categories is at some stage, they are going to need what you are selling. Because at some stage, they are either going to sell their, their property or they're going to rent it out. So if you are the person they turn to when they want to have that conversation, that is another way to replace those inevitable potential losses from your rental pool. They get a job transfer. They have a divorce whatever it might be. So again, from a management rights perspective, I think one of the strongest things and one of the best things you can do is go and get either your salesperson certificate so you can actually sell real estate or get your full license. Now, even I've got my qualifications for a full license, I haven't actually got a license. I went and did that on the basis that, and again, this follows through with the slides, is I'm effectively in the property industry. I deal all day, every day with clients, well, with management rights clients, with property management and property issues. So as much as uh, my university degree didn't teach me a cracker about the stuff I do today, you've got to get more down and detailed about it. So I've gone and got my ticket as much as I don't use it. So I think from a um, credibility perspective, if you have LREA after your name, as you are a licensed real estate agent, then you can put your hand on your heart and say we're just as good as the Ray Whites or the LJ Hookers or whoever it is that's trying to pinch business in your building because we are the same qualifications, yet we are here actually doing this day in, day out. They're not. So I think um, from a credibility perspective, that's well worth doing. And those last three categories there are how you actually make sure that you replace units that you are potentially going to lose from your rental pool because that's where they come from. The other thing we do see in management rights a little bit um, more these days are external rentals. Um, so rentals outside the scheme, uh, which probably um, doesn't happen, I think, because managers go chasing it. As best I can tell, it's they do a good job for their existing clients and their existing clients have two other properties that are somewhere nearby. They say, well, would you mind managing these for us as well? And of course, you can only do that if you've got a full licence because you can't manage it, manage it under your RLA because your RLA is limited to renting units in the scheme which you own alone, so then you need to go get a full licence to provide those things. So we've got quite a few contracts going through at the moment that might have 10, 12, 20 external managements hanging off the back. So from a legal perspective, it's not that hard. From a pricing perspective, you need to deal with your broker because a rent roll is different to management rights pricing, but either way, it still keeps the business ticking away. So, um, and those come from servicing those last three groups there, as well as the investors you're doing a good job for already. So in terms of, um, that's where I think we need to get to, and the question is how we actually get there. So, um, and some simple things. So probably I've broken this down into things you can do that are front of house, and things you can do that are back of house. So front of house, um, and this is all about presenting a professional appearance. So ideally, you don't toddle around your scheme in thongs, a pair of stubbies and a singlet. Um, what I think is well and truly worth investing in is a polo shirt with Higginson Towers and Frank on it. It just makes you look professional. It's a start. Now I'm in uh, jeans and a sort of collared shirt here today. I wouldn't be here in a pair of shorts and a um, short sleeve t-shirt. Uh, but if I was going to present to the board of directors at A and Z, I'd be wearing a suit and tie. I mean, you've got to tailor your appearance for your audience. But for me, that type of um, dress code and just looking the part is a very simple thing to do, and it's nice and easy. So um, that's number one. Number two, letterhead and emails. Now again, some of this will be tech related, and tech isn't that hard. So Word actually creates a bunch of formats for you. And I'm sure, like Scott, you guys produce at the end of month accounting, you know, professional statements, all that sort of thing. Probably what I'm talking about here is the communications you have with everyone else in terms of just a simple letterhead. Frank Higginson, manager Higginson Towers, address, email, 
signed, presented properly. And again, back to similarities between our businesses, if you get a letter from us, it's going to be on our letterhead, it's going to look the same. All of our people inside their own professional sort of framework will present the things the same way because we need to have a consistent approach. It's not quite McDonald's where you get the same Big Mac in every Mac in the world, but it'll be pretty close. So for you guys, I think having some formal letterhead that you use for all formal communication is unreal. Um, and the other thing that I think will make a whole heap of sense, and I'll explain why again in due course, is everyone uses, you know, there's Higginson Towers at gmail.com or manager at, um, what I think would be better would be actually going and registering a domain name, higginsontowers.com.net.au, whatever it might be, and just punching your emails through that. So manager at, Frank at, because then, and that doesn't, that doesn't mean you have to have a web page, it just means you own the domain. And for me, when you go to sell your business, what that actually adds then is some continuity. Because all of the emails that you've been sending over the previous years in relation to the business, and you just go to the discipline to make sure that you don't use that from a personal perspective as well, um, all sit with that. But that domain name gives you a bit more control, and to me it just looks that tiny bit more professional than a Gmail or Hotmail. And again, some of you might be doing all this, some of you might be doing none of it. Like from my end, up to you what you take out of this, but I'll just give you what I think would be best practice. Um, photos and written communication. When you're competing with real estate agents, you need to do what they do. They have professional photographers, they have rock star pictures. A blurred picture of an iPhone on a rental on REA just looks appalling. And that's how the competitors will run you over. Just make it look professional. And the same with written communication, spell check. It's simple stuff like that. Um, and, as again, as I always say, is not writing down what you feel, writing down what needs to be said. You know, I've got a client at the moment for sending an uh, in trouble for sending um, a pretty abusive email to a chairperson, which absolutely was deserved, but was unnecessary. So yeah, she had it coming, but we just didn't need to deal with it that way. Um, and that's now come back to biting them. So again, that sort of stuff, when you circulate it around, looks bad. And again, Mark, wherever you are, um, every single thing one day might appear in court. How would you go when a judge is looking at that? So just those things keeping in mind are really important. And again, if you can't be professional, I suppose, at least look like it. And those three things, for me, are probably the most important front of house things you can do. And then there's the back of house stuff. Um, so websites. So for those of you with short-term rentals, you've probably already got this sorted, booking engines, um, about us, contact us, reviews, TripAdvisor, all that stuff, which is great. Um, I think that even if you just had a one-pager, Higginson Towers, my contact details, picture of me, services we offer, and what are management rights. So if you go to our website, again, this is where it's the same stuff, that's what our website has in it. It's got a whole lot more detail in terms of past newsletters and all the rest of it, but the core of it is that. And you've got to remember that people don't know what management rights are. I mean, I come back to all of you. It's not a natural career path. Now, if you think back to how you found out about this industry, it's probably word of mouth. It's not going to be a careers seminar at school. It's not going to be um, probably even ads in the paper these days. Maybe it's our, uh, real commercial in terms of business opportunities. Uh, but more often than not, it's, it's friends. You might have stayed at a resort and thought, oh, what's this person do? Oh, this management rights business. People don't know what it actually is. So I think if you educate them about what it is, that is not necessarily half the battle, but it starts the battle. And again, from my end, I think even a one-pager in terms of click here for links about what it is that we do, you just bloody hyperlink our website. There's enough stuff on there about the basics of management rights and the rest of it that explain to people what it is. And part of our battle as lawyers is still educating committees about this is a contract, you can't change that contract, you are stuck with it. We do that all day, every day. And that's despite management rights being in legislation since 1997. We still have those battles. Because anyone can buy a unit and anyone can put their hand up to get on committee and then it comes down to their advisors as to what they get told. So if you can make that just a little bit easier for people to understand what they're dealing with by virtue of having a one-pager, I think that's an excellent thing. And it also means they don't have to go around digging to find out about you. Part of our website is, you know, 
my credentials and all that sort of stuff so that people can see what it is I do and I don't need to tell them that I got best lawyers and all that sort of jazz. Because that is, yeah, I, anyway, it's there. So that's a credibility thing, people can find out. Um, next thing then, all this social media stuff, um, sometimes it probably goes too far, but again, how do you communicate with your people? And I suspect that probably everyone's on at least one of those, unless you've decided to completely exit that arena, uh, which I did with Facebook a couple of years ago, and I'm still super happy with it, but I love Twitter. You know what I mean? So I follow people on Twitter. So imagine if you've got one of those, and I think there are packages where you can punch out a bit of content across all of the platforms by pressing one button. Um, you say to your people on your web page or on your letterhead, follow me at. And then you just tell people what's going on. We chopped down some trees today. The building's looking great. We just had this pressure washed. You know, unit 303 is just sold for whatever it might be. People are interested in that. Because again, you've got that link. Everyone is interested in what's going on in their building. Um, and that also then helps explain what it is you do. We need a new pool pump. We've gone and got three quotes. This is the one we're doing. It's going to be installed in three weeks' time. It just tells people what you do without you having to do it. Um, and most people will be, like I said, on at least one of those things. Um, so yeah, that last one really, you know, again, when you want to become a lawyer, you, well, you go get a law degree, uh, you do what I do. Um, of course, there's lots of other things you can use a law degree for, but certainly what I'm doing is a very traditional career path. What management rights is, people don't know. So your job, as unfortunate as it might be, is to help educate people about what it is that you do. And if you do that, you'll take away a lot of these misconceptions from the start. Um, next thing is educate yourself. So there is a lot of, and we get it all day, uh, want a better phrase, bush lawyers. Uh, one, uh, I used that phrase on a web page at one stage and someone blew up about me calling regional practitioners numpties. And it's like, no mate, that's not what I'm saying. I'm calling everyone who's not a lawyer that pretends to be a lawyer a numpty. So bush lawyers, and they are bound in strata land because someone will ring the commissioner's office, give them their version of events, and then they'll come back and say, the commissioner told me this. It's like, well, no, that's based on what you told them. That's not actually what is going on. Um, they are everywhere in bodies corporate. Absolutely everywhere. Um, my round of golf yesterday was with a chairperson, it turns out, who tells me that their, long story, um, their manager is a former lawyer who's decided the body corporate can tow cars under common law. It's like, mate, you can't. So he's gone and got these big, you know, 60 by 60 signs and he's going to start towing people. I said, you just let him do whatever he wants to do, but he is going to go under the bus at some stage. Um, and he's actually a qualified lawyer pretending to be a bush lawyer. So for me, what you need to do um, in these things is position yourself so that you know the answers. As many of them as you can. Um, and that's not to, again, necessarily put me out of a job, but there is lots of stuff that gets thrown around in these bodies' corporates that is completely inaccurate. So, um, and what I've done is I've put at the end of this uh, presentation that will be on what gets emailed to everyone afterwards a bunch of links to these things. So there's a course the Commissioner's Office offers where you can go through and get basically Body Corporate 101. And at the end of it, you get a little pretty certificate. So certainly what we do now from a, when we're acting for people buying management rights is we say to them, go and do this course online, get the certificate and put it with your resume. But that walks you through a whole lot of the BCCM details. And so I think it's a really good thing to do because without that, you'll come out of that with something that you will know you can call someone wrong at some stage when they try to run you over by telling you that they spoke to the commissioner and. So doing that course is a wonderful thing. Um, in terms of uh, understanding what's going in the property market, realestate.com.au, probably more than anything else in Queensland, domain's not really here because that was a, was a Fairfax thing. Um, you can subscribe to your local area on REA. They'll give you medians, they'll send you through what's going on. They'll send you through a whole bunch of property information about Newstead or about Coomera or whatever it might be. And that's stuff that your clients and your owners won't necessarily have. So there's a method of my madness. Hear me out here. Um, where are we going? Uh, newspapers. I mean, I, I love my media. Um, and you've only, media loves property. Every single day there's property stories at the moment. Um, not all of them are necessarily happy ones, but 
Again, that's what's going on in the market. So being aware of what's going on is really important. Um, local, state and federal governments, there's newsletters from all of those people from time to time. And I think for me, particularly for investors, uh, because they're not necessarily local, they don't know what's going on in the local market. They're relying on you to actually tell them. Uh, like I said, get your full licence, I think is a wonderful thing from a credentials perspective. Um, and Heron Todd White uh, produces an excellent monthly email with summaries of Brisbane, Gold, Sunny Coast, Mackay, Cairns, Townsville, uh, Port Douglas, etc., etc. So that, um, to me, is really worth subscribing to. So I'll put the link at the back of that in terms of what's going on in your local market and area. Um, local agents, of course, are going to give you a heap of information if you pretend to be an interested buyer in your local area so you can see what your competition's doing. Um, and the last thing then is we punch out a whole bunch of content as much as I haven't done as much this year as I should because for whatever reason, March is conference season. So over the course of uh, this month, I've done two conferences and I think this is my fifth presentation in March, but I'm done after this. So I'll get back to finishing probably some of the content that I've started um, that I think is relevant. But, you know, management rights brokers produce a whole lot of content, finance brokers do, Mike Phipps does a good newsletter, um, and Nick Buick, the on-site manager, also produces some good stuff. So if you collectively have all of that, you have all of the information in the world that you can use to communicate to your owners. And remember I said owners, not investors, your owners. Because what you need to do is let everyone know that you are the go-to person. And you do that by letting them know what's going on. And I don't think you even need to say, come and use me. You do that by virtue of the fact that you're in their face in a gentle way, in a professional way, with stuff that's relevant to them. So if you're talking to people about what units are renting for, what property is selling for, what's going on in the local market, that positions you as the person they call when they have a question in relation to that. And that is how you're going to make sure that you keep topping units up from your rental pool as and when they go. Because you will be the person they call. And if you stay in touch with them, so every person, um, and again, we're back to our role, we're back to finding out how, what people's email addresses are, um, ideally we're not sending stuff in post, but I don't think it's that hard to be ringing owners or talking to owners and say, hey, I'm going to start producing some stuff, give me a news, your email address and I'll send it through to you. Now recognising again that probably not every person every time is going to want this. Some mightn't. Um, I get unsubscribes and I still get offended by it. It's like, why don't you hear what I want to say? It's relevant to you. Um, but people are going to do what they're going to do. So all you've got to do is keep chipping away. So, um, and the regular frequency really for me is down to you and your building and what you think it needs. Like from my end, I should be sending out something every probably two to three weeks. I've got enough stuff to write, I've got enough stories to write, I've just got to find the time to produce it and get it out there. For you, um, it's really up to you and I suppose um, what I'd suggest is it's no less than every three months. So four times a year, sending out a one page newsletter with what's gone on shouldn't be that hard to do. And to be honest, um, if we get organised um, in terms of what we do, I should be offering that as a subscription service to managers. I'll do it for you. You just give me your region. Because I've got access to all this stuff. Um, but if you're in touch with those people, they then know what you do, they can look you up, they can see what it is that you do, and when they have that property question, they call you. And ideally, that's with respect to sales as well. Um, so for me, like I said, it's probably email, um, and it's stuff that's in informative to them. So what you don't want to do is send rubbish. If you send, you know, dodgy jokes, may well, maybe small ones at the end, but what they're really interested in, without doubt, is what's going on in the property market in your building, without fail. Of course they are. It's in their interest to know what's going on. Um, so telling them what's going on, to me, is what they need to know. If you want to add some peripheral stuff, then happy days. Um, and the other thing then that allows you to do um, is control the message and manage expectations. So we're back to that person who wants their 400 bucks a week and the market has been dropping and tenancies are harder to find and it's actually 380. If you have been sending newsletters, 
that have been speaking about what's going on out there and the latest market trends and all that sort of stuff, then perhaps I think that's an easier way to have that conversation with owners because they're ready for it. They know what's going on. And that's the reality of it. So it's very easy um, to shoot the messenger if it's a surprise. And certainly part of my job um, is uh, managing bad news from time to time. You know, we've got one, I should say, Amy O'Donnell, my business partner's up the back. Uh, we had a client come in yesterday who has a um, management rights agreement that had a 10 year term and a 15 year option. And the good news is that the option was defined in the definitions, but there isn't actually an option period in the agreement, which means they don't have an option period, which is fairly fatal. So um, that's the conversation I'm having this afternoon when I go back to the office and we didn't act for them, which is good, uh, but someone's got a copper spear on that one. Um, but and it's the same with you guys with respect to pricing. You know, like if you're in sales, this is what I want, or this is what I paid for it. That doesn't matter. In this environment, it's what it's worth. And managing people around that is a whole lot easier if you've been informing them about what's going on in the property market. If you're gonna be in that sales side of things. Um, and that is, to me, very simply, how you find clients. Because if you do that properly, you will do that much better than any external agent. Any external agent does not have the same interest in the building that you do. They will be scattergunning people, firing stuff around about Kangaroo Point as a whole, as opposed to your specific building. And what everyone in your building cares about is their specific building. They want to know what their property is worth. So if you keep communicating around that, ideally, they're the ones that turn to you and they're the ones that you replace. The people that inevitably leave. Now, that is a whole lot of effort. Don't get me wrong. That's not... Uh, just press a button, happens overnight, this is all going to be sweet. It takes some time. It takes some effort. And for me, there's a couple of reasons. Um, that's actually Eddie Edwards, the ski jumper from ever. When I did a Google search of Eddie the expert, all I got was pictures of Professor Edward someone or other from Harvard University or otherwise. And then so I thought, bugger it, Eddie the eagle will do. Um, you're not going to become a slalom skier. But what you are with respect to your building and your client's potential properties is Eddie the expert in relation to what's going on in your building. And you have positioned yourself that way by virtue of what you have communicated with them over that period of time. And more importantly, you actually know what's going on. You know what's going on in your building. You know what units are rental for because you're all going to be doing that. Ideally, you know what units are selling for because you'll still be involved in all that scuttlebutt. And even if you don't, want to sell in your own right, I think the other thing to do is to try to partner up with a local agent that knows the deal in terms of, yes, you could conjunct or otherwise, um, but if they're going to sell units and they sell to an investor, they make sure the management comes back to you and they don't try to keep it themselves. Up to you, but I really do think in a management rights sense, you need to be able to have a sales channel that you have a relationship with. Now, ideally that's you, but if it's not you, it's someone else that you do have a relationship with. Because if it just goes to the local agent, then those agents get um, bonuses based on management's coming into their principal's rental pool and of course, money talks. So if they're gonna get a thousand bucks for a management appearing in the principal's rental pool, then that's where it's going. So you need to try to have that relationship to stop it happening. But you do that by being Eddie the expert. Um, this is another one. Now, this is a Mike O'Farrell special. So Mike uh, has been in management rights forever, was the president of, well, I suppose, Brisbane Arama branch for a while. Um, he gave me this line, owners aren't owners, they're voters. So as much as what I've been talking about is protecting the value of your business in terms of property managements and replacing appointments and sales and all those sort of things, every two to five years, subject to which module you're in, you are gonna be asking your body corporate for it to top up to your management rights agreements. And at that stage, all of these people are gonna be asked, do you want to vote yes or do you want to vote no? Now, if they've never heard of you and they don't know what you do and you've never communicated with them and the first time they hear from you is you reach out three weeks before the AGM saying, please vote yes to motion 12, you're gonna get a whole lot different to reaction than if you've been communicating with them for two or three years and letting them know what's going on in the building because they've heard from you, you're a friend, 
you're keeping them informed, and that will trigger more of them to support you than not. And at that stage, you've got to remember that these things are only, um, there's no compulsory voting in bodies corporates. It's a, uh, every management rights motion, in effect, is simply more votes for than against of those who choose to vote. So um, a building of 100 units, if there's only five voters and three are in favour and two are against, that motion is approved. So what you need to do is make sure that your friends vote yes for you. And you can't ever take this stuff for granted. Um, I reckon uh, we would put through, I don't know, maybe 10 odd variations a month in effect. So people topping their agreements up because those of you who've been before, we run a program reminding clients to do what they need to do and when they need to do it. I reckon over the course of the year, we would win, um, or our clients would get up in at least probably 95% of those. Um, we had one the other day where the client owned a lot in their building and they lost because the voting was nil-nil. <laughs> Which I had the returning officer who um, I go to and sometimes we're with her and sometimes we're against her. So she rang me and said, Frank, you are not going to believe this, but... Um, so I rang, I rang the client and said, mate, um, you've just lost. Oh, we lost. I said, you didn't vote. One nil would have got it there. And that's a building of 130 units. So it should have been the easiest thing in the world, but no. So next year we'll go around again. We'll probably cast our vote. We'll probably have two people vote against us and we lose. Anyway, so um, they are voters. So when you ask them for a favour, and they know you and you have helped them, they are more than likely to say yes. And they are more than likely to say yes if they've never heard from you before. And so that's not, I wouldn't call it the gauntlet you run, that's something you need to do. Um, but doing all of that stuff previously makes it a hell of a lot easier to get those things across the line. And again, remembering that the committee is accountable to the owners. So we do occasionally run into obstructionist committees that don't want to support top-ups or members of the Unionized Association who are vehemently anti-management rights no matter what it is, which is just insane. Um, so we have to take those people on from time to time. And ultimately, it is the will of the people that decides these things. So if those owners want you, then you will win. And that's relationships with your owners that then matter. Um, the last one for me um, that I don't think anyone's really got hold of yet, but um, it'll be interesting if some of you walk out of here and listen to this and in three years' time I start to see this. You know, part of our due diligence now in a management rights purchase is looking at effectively the systems that the uh, seller may have. You know, particularly it's always been IP has been an issue for the last couple of years in terms of particularly short-term buildings, websites, domain names, free call numbers, um, OTA agreements, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but from a permanent perspective, it still applies. Imagine if you've got two businesses side by side, same net, same approximate price, same basic makeup. If one has a program running all these things that I'm talking about in terms of regular newsletters, knowing what's going on, website set up, contact us page, all that sort of thing, versus how most businesses are sold with a Gmail address that we're going to keep and that's it, which one's easier to sell? has to be that first one. So whether you add anything to the value or not, I don't know, and probably that's where I get to from a term perspective. Obviously, the longer the term you've got in management rights, the better off you are. I don't know how, um, certainly not a value, how term translates into price, like whether there's a difference of any nature between a 25-year term and a 22-year term or an 18-year term or a 12-year term, but you know, I think to me where I get to from a client perspective is the longer you've got, the easier it is to sell. Because there are some people, um, for their business reasons, that won't buy anything with less than 24 years to run. End of story. So that's one less buyer if you've got 23. I think that relates back to finance, doesn't it? It certainly does now. Yeah. 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 But if you've got cash, it doesn't matter. But yes, yeah. agree. Um, but probably the, the pricing thing, and certainly um, banks are not being any easier to deal with. Like we're now doing 42-day um, finance clauses in contracts. You know, the old, you know, you go back three years, it would have been 28. They are impossible. But my take would be, is that if you have this stuff set up, it is going to be more attractive to a buyer when they come around to look at businesses. And I think it will also help then from a body corporate perspective, because bodies corporates are certainly getting 
call it difficult, um, call it more detailed uh, in terms of assignments. Um, and again, that's particularly the case where they've got issues with their current managers. They tend to look at buyers a whole lot tighter. If you have programs and systems, and again, that probably comes back also to what you're doing from a day-to-day -day perspective, management rights wise, like talking to Murray and Sandy before in terms of you start and there is no system. You just got to figure it out. You know, if you had a leaving aside your caretaking agreement, what you should do on a daily, weekly, monthly as required basis for your own internal management, that would be a good thing. Because that's what body corporates are starting to ask for in terms of do you actually know what you need to do? So to me, um, that in due course would actually add value to businesses and certainly make it easier to sell. Um, and so I suppose it's easy to stand here and for me to come up with all these ideas and same as anything, like we, um, every journey starts with but a single step. So, um, and for me, every process is this. In terms of understanding things, it's where are we now? So you all know where your businesses are with respect to the stuff I've been talking about today. You know whether you do some of it, none of it, all of it, whatever it might be. Where do you want to go? You need to decide whether the things I've been speaking about are worth it. Um, and I suppose that does depend where you're at in terms of your relationship with your body corporate. Like some of you might have broken relationships already. But to me, you've got to start somewhere. Because if nothing changes, nothing changes. Because you still can build relationships with owners. Because the stuff that uh, committees send out is never going to resonate as well as what you will because you care you've got an interest in making sure this stuff's done properly the committee will send stuff out usually by body corporate managers once every six months they won't do the personal relationship building that you will so even if you are behind the eight ball um, I still think it's worth, in, worth investing in some form of program of this nature to get you where you need to go and then that really that last point then is how do you get there? So um, for me, I reckon it's starting with some of the easy stuff off that list, be it dress code, be it setting up your templates, um, be it a domain name, whatever it might be, and just chipping away from there. And I think what, um, and I'll say this Amy, I think probably inside 12 months, uh, we need to get to the stage of being able to offer some form of subscription service that produces this as part of the program so we can produce the content for you. Um, so yeah, but you've got to start somewhere. And that's not to say, you know, things might be all sweet and I know that can happen too, um, but things can go bad overnight and things can go good overnight. It's subject to whoever is on that particular committee. So um, you might have the most beautiful committee in the world at the moment. But next year's AGM, if they get sick of it and you get a bunch of militant people in, you want to have these relationships locked down. And if you don't have these relationships locked down now and you do have a militant committee, then the time to start is now. Um, that, I just think, is what you need to do. Um, so there you go. Um, perception becomes reality. So if you look the part and act the part and know the part, you do become Eddie the expert. But really, um, whatever you're going to say, and lawyers are good at this, say it with confidence. I've stood up here today and said everything I said with confidence, but I actually do believe in it. Um, that's not to say it necessarily fits for you, but what you need to do with your owners is each of those things. Looking the parts easy, that's that professional back of house stuff. Acting the part and knowing the part are really that education stuff, having your presentation behind the scenes all organised, um, and then people will simply regard you as Eddie the expert. And that is how you preserve the value of your business and add value by replacing those units that you will ever inevitably lose. Um, so that's not as long as some of the ones I've done, but that's really it for me. And I suppose questions then from anyone about anything. Thank you. You run around with that and I'll Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, I have a question, maybe general, um, but I, I don't have a correct answer before. Um, <clears throat> the question is, uh, we, we all know that the manager is uh, the member of the committee, um, but in many cases we heard that the uh, other committee members 
uh, uh, try to uh, exclude the manager to have the meeting and yeah. have their um, service or you know, can motion or something to uh, tell the manager to do this or do that. But I, I just want to clarify that it's a uh, appropriate or legal. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Check this out. Yep, so every, um, this is something that Trevor Rawnsley is fighting the fight on for ARAMA, is in 2008 the uh, regulations were changed so that resident managers or effectively caretaking service contractors as the way the legislation defines it, uh, were removed or, or sorry, had their ability to be a voting member of the committee removed. So what happens now is that a resident or a caretaking service contractor, so if you've got a caretaking agreement, you are automatically a non-voting member of the committee. You are elected to that position. Well, you're not even elected to that position, you are. But um, that doesn't stop. So what should happen in, in theory is that if there is a, anything committee related, you should be included in what's being circulated. So if there's an agenda for a meeting, you should get that agenda like a normal committee member would. Um, you should be a participant in committee discussions other than where you've got a direct interest in them. So if they're talking about uh, your performance as caretaker, they can ask you to leave the room. That, that's legitimate. Uh, but lots of committees don't do that. So for me, um, that's a question of whether you want to have that fight or not. Because the reality is from my end, is if they're going to go and have secret squirrel meetings behind the scenes and not actually have a formal committee meeting, then they can do that and they can still have those same discussions. So committees obviously make lots of decisions behind the scenes that don't happen at formal meetings. So if the six of them want to get together in the chairperson's unit at 6.30 and discuss what's going to happen over the next three months for the committee, they can do that. And they're just doing that as friends, not as a committee. So to me, where you would get to by trying to tow that legal line in terms of I must be there and you must include me and all this sort of stuff is just going to lead to them going to that outcome where they do this stuff without you outside the parameters of what the formal agreement is or the formal legislation. So from a management rights perspective, um, that's one of those things where sometimes you can be proactive and sometimes you can be reactive. What you need to do if they're starting to do that sort of stuff is just make sure you continue to do your job. So if you continue to do your job, there is nothing that they're going to be able to do to you in a legal sense. So let them go and have their conversations and have all their secret meetings because there's nothing really of substance that's going to come of it that you can't deal with as and when it's needed. Because even if they were going to discuss something about you, they can still ask you to go. So in that sense, it doesn't really, it, it's sort of, I want a better phrase, point score in terms of you've got to have me there because I'll just find a way around it. So that, that's my take on those things. So in theory, yes, they're in breach of the legislation, but in practice, there's no point trying to hold them to account because it won't get you anywhere. Two microphones next time, isn't it? I might yell. No worries. Uh, thanks, Frank. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, the chairman of our committee seems to believe that everything's a secret. So that when there's issues being discussed between us, as, 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 even though I'm a non-voting member, mm -hmm. he believes that I shouldn't discuss it with the owners of the building. Um, my theory is that everybody in my letting pool should not be aware of what's going on. So I tell them. And then I get into trouble. <laughs> At one stage, I was so irate with the committee about lighting at the front of the building, I said to them, look, just don't bother about it, I'll do a quick vote around. So I sent emails to all of my people in the letting pool and said, do you like this light fitting or do you like that light fitting? They all came back and said, we like this light fitting. So I emailed them back and I said, they want this one. They don't want that ugly modern thing. Yeah. Okay. You want not to, as it comes back, may as well be capital letters screaming at me. And I think, well, What's the secret? Why can't yep. I talk about it? Yep. Am I under any thing that says I can't discuss things openly yep. with the owners of the building? Yep. Um, Just the committee? Yeah, so there's, there's no such thing as cabinet solidarity in bodies corporate. I can assure you of that. Um, so in that sense, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yep, cool. I've just got you just hang on to that and I'll shout. It's all good. Um, so in theory, yes, you can go tell everyone 
anything that goes on at committee level. So the, probably the exceptions to that I'd say would be um, privileged information, which is sort of advice the body corporate's got about litigation potentially, or stuff that might be defamatory. But other than that, everything is fair game. So that's the legal position. I think the commercial position is you've got to fight about control. Your chairperson wants to control what's going on. So, and that is back to, I suppose, session we did previously in terms of, do you want to have that fight? Does it matter? And where I get to with that is, does this advance your cause? Does having that conversation with owners and, or your, your investors in your rental pool and engaging with them about what type of lighting goes out the front advance the cause of your business? And my take would be probably not. Like from your end, who cares whether it's clunky, you know, you might have a, an aesthetic approach and maybe you're an architect in a former life, in which case vision of things and the form of things makes a massive difference. But from my end, um, I would be keeping my head down because your chairperson clearly wants to control what goes on, be the ultimate decision maker and all that sort of stuff. And if it doesn't affect you, let it go. That would be my take. So what you're doing is legally 100% right. You can do that. The question is whether you're going to pick an unnecessary fight where something goes wrong then on a management rights front and he's into you because he doesn't like what you're doing with respect to his control. I'm assuming it's him. Um, that, that's your issue. So yeah, so you're right, but it's sort of treading a dangerous path would be my bet. Yep. And he does want to have control. Yep. He really does want to control. But by standing up for yourself, you're, yeah, you're picking a fight. Yeah, you're, so what? He, he's, yeah, yeah, and he's the chairperson that was voted in by the people. So they have elected him to make these decisions and to drive this decision. Well, well then he got elected because no one stood against him. That's the thing. So, um, and... I think it could. No, I think it. I've already built up that 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 relationship, and they actually don't care what he says. Cool. So my attitude is, don't worry about when it gets snitchy and wants to be in control. Well, I actually won't. I've done it again and again and again, beginning with Ali. He, he went on like a lunatic for a year, yep. battering me, and then shutting me down. And at the end of the day, if we won, cool. we needed this. And we needed this. Cool. Not what he thought. Well, you've made the commercial decision that you want to make. That's fine. So, yes, if you want to pick those fights, you absolutely can tell people what's going on. Zero problem with it. Thank you. I'll go over here, Ron. Thank you. Two. Oh, we record. That goes into the recording thing at the back. Yeah. Um, um, we're constantly. We have managed 220 units, um, and we're constantly being told we uh, get overpaid for trimming the hedges. I'm looking for. I'm looking for a magic. Um, Hold the microphone a bit closer. No, I'm looking for a magic um, phrase to describe what management is, not hedge cutting. Cool. Can you source me that? Tell me where to find it. <laughs> I, I have a newsletter half written that starts with, I have a magic wand. No, I don't. Um, and I suppose this is, to me, we're back to communicating value. So in terms of your, they, so they're blowing about the, up about the costs of the hedge trimming. So do you, tr do you trim that separately? To, so you, most management rights agreements would say you're getting paid X dollars to do all of these things. So is there a separate cost in there for the hedge trimming? No, no. but that's what they focus on. Well, I think this is part of an education process in terms of guys, we're paid X dollars to do all of this stuff. So there is no apportionment of pricing in there. And, and Dead said there's one agreement I've ever seen that apportioned price between what was called objectives. So the gardening objective, the security objective, the pool maintenance objective, the security objective, and it said this is one, two, three, four, five. That's the only agreement I've seen in my life that had dollar values to it, which you'd assume, but again, even that was started 10 years ago, so proportionately over time, 
It might be easier to say it continues in the same, but it probably doesn't because the cost of labour changes depending on what the services are. So for your building, I suppose, in terms of um, hedge trimming, my question is firstly trying to understand why they want to know, and then B, it's probably bringing them around to it doesn't actually matter. I'm not charging you any extra or any less. I'm going to deliver the services that I've got to under this agreement that no one can change. And I suppose then that factors back to in due course, you're going to be asking for a top up. So when we're asking for a top up, no doubt if these same people are there, there might be some sort of niggle still coming about the hedge trimming. And then it's like, well, what do we turn that into from our perspective? You know, so it's, um, so no, I don't have the magic wand for you because I don't understand what it is they're looking for. You know what I mean? Because even if they do, if you do apportion a price to the trimming of the hedges, it's not going to make any difference to your agreement. And I suppose in a sense, if they want to know what that component of the contract is worth, well then sure, we'll go and get a quote from you know, Frank Higginson Hedge Trimmers and you can see what they would charge for the same service. But what that's got to do with my contract is neither here nor there. So yeah, it's probably um, trying to understand where people are coming from is the starting point, but sometimes you're still not going to understand. <laughs> That's my experience. Yeah, why are they doing this? I don't know. I can't understand it. It's just that, you know, and people are coming from different angles all the time. I'll stay on this side and I'll come across the other side. Hello, Fred. I think I will stop. Yeah, so um, these days I've heard that a lot of people find that selling management rights. So uh, at the last, uh, the last step was the, um, it's going to be the main uh, body corporate is going to transfer the agreements to the new buyer. Um, I, I've heard a lot of people who are talking about that the body corporates start to hire a lawyer for, yep. for doing the big yep. ver verification, but normally it's done by the seller or all the buyer's lawyers. Yeah. Do you think it's necessary to have the seller paying for the cost? and um, uh, to have the agreement being transferred to the... Yep, cool. So if we go back... Um, so the, the question really is what's going on from a sales perspective in terms of what is corporate uh, basically engaging professionals to advise in relation to assignments. So if you go back, if you send me an email afterwards, I'll send you the... I did, I think the very first one of these was a seminar to would-be management rights sellers. And that was something I spent probably about 15 or 20 minutes on. So I'll send you a link to those. I'll send you a link to that if you send me an email. But where I get to, I suppose, and I'm one of those people that plays both sides of the fence. I'll act for bodies corporates. I'll act for managers. You know, it's, I've got a skill set to offer. I might as well offer it to everyone. Um, where, where it gets to from a body corporate perspective is the legislation absolutely allows a body corporate to recover its legal and administrative costs in relation to considering an assignment. And in that sense, what happens in an assignment is a body corporate is asked to consent to it and it's asked to sign formal legal documents to that effect. So in that sense, when a body corporate's asked to do something legally, it's well and truly entitled to go and get legal advice. And of course, that's a little bit subjective because I'm sometimes what that legal advice comes from. And the body corporate's only been asked to do that by virtue of the parties agreeing to buy and sell. So it's been put to legal expense through no fault of its own. It's a party to a contract that requires this. So to me, getting legal advice has and always will be an absolute no-brainer. Where it gets a little bit twistier is that um, there's this new breed of consultants coming in doing assessment reviews of buyers in relation to whether they can perform duties and all sorts of things. So that's what's appeared probably in the last two years or so. Um, and there is more and more of that. Um, it's pushed by a few strata managers and probably one or two lawyers in particular. Um, and it probably comes back to the nature of committees where all committee members are volunteers. None of them are qualified, skilled, absolutely. Um, <laughs> sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. Um, so they put their hand up to do this for good reasons or bad. And then they're asked to make an assessment of a buyer. And again, particularly, again, I see these assessments more where body corporates have issues with their existing managers. So where committees get to there is we've been having grief because of X, Y, and Z for the last couple of years. Um, if we consent to another buyer, we want to be able to blame someone else for that decision if it goes bad. We don't want to be criticised for saying yes in circumstances where we could have done something different. So that, more than anything else, I think is driving 
where these parties come from. So if an assessor comes out and says, yes, they can do the job, and normally that's where it gets to. It's very rare to see them refuse, but normally they'll get to, yes, they can do the job, but we would recommend that they do an ARAMA course or sometimes an ABMA course um, or whatever it might be. So, um, and practically, normally it then gets ticked off and away we go. So that, to me, is where the world is at the moment. So I'll send you those slides though, because I did probably about 20 minutes on it. And that I don't think will change anytime soon. Yep, so the question is, can the body corporate say no in effect to an assignment? What a body corporate can't do is unreasonably withhold consent to an assignment. So, the, and that, of course, is where lawyers make their money, what's unreasonable. Um, it's the same as what's just and equitable. It's like all these wonderful nebulous legal phrases. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, in terms of refusals, I've absolutely seen more probably in the last two or three years than I've seen in the last 20, but I didn't see any in the first 20 years. So, um, and, and to be honest, the refusals I've seen um, have never been new managers. They've always been previous managers. Uh, and that's because, for whatever reason, and it's a legitimate body corporate question, if you've owned management rights in a previous building, can we please have your chairperson or your body corporate manager? Um, the worst one we had was a client buying two buildings, as it turned out, and it turned out the chairperson of one of the buildings he was buying happened to know the chairperson at the one he was at and rang him and said, what do you know about so-and-so? He said, what on earth is he doing with you? He said, oh, he's trying to buy these things. Well, sit tight. Um, and sent through all of that nasty correspondence in terms of calling people, all the things under the sun, sent through copies of the remedial action notices that issued to him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that body corporate said no. And it was very, we were acting for the buyer. It was very hard to contest that, you know? Um, and actually, well, the other really hilarious one, I've got, I've got five minutes, was uh, we were acting for the seller of this one. Buy came along, didn't smell right, but we ended up getting to body corporate approval. Resume came through, um, and the body corporate lawyer, because again, this is a little bit of a mafia, we all know everyone, the body corporate lawyer rang me and said, Frank, I think we've got troubles with this one. I said, why is that? I said, well, Google this. And he gave me the name to Google. Okay, so I Googled this name, and up came a, um, you know, one of these military imposters. Fake, fake medals, and there's, there's websites, you know, that, that name these people for the charade. You know, said he was doing this, said he was doing this, didn't do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I said, mate, what's that got to do with anything? He said, that's the buyer. I said, but the buyer's name is this. He said, no, 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 go down to the bottom of his resume. So you go down to the bottom of his resume, and he'd left his former name instead of his new name. But he had the photo, so it was the same person. I was just like, right, there we go. <laughs> We couldn't argue that one either. So, um, so bodies corporates can say no, um, but they can't do it unreasonably. So I've had, um, so when you get towards disclosure of things, I've had clients that have been bankrupt where they can't say no. Uh, I had a client uh, who'd been convicted of GBH, uh, and that was within the last two years. So from a fair trading perspective, they won't give you a license if you've done that inside the last five years. So the body corporate said no on that one. Uh, but I've had clients who, a client in particular spent time in the jail for dealing cocaine. But that was 10 years ago. So she got approved. Because again, if you do the crime, you do your time. You know, like I think if someone had a criminal conviction for trust account fraud, like to me, that would be a valid basis to say no, no matter how long ago it happened. Stealing as an employee, absolutely. Um, but the experience thing is the one that bodies corporates hang their hat on. And I think it's, it's really hard to say someone can't do a job. You know what I mean? So from a letting perspective, you go do the qualifications, you have the right software and program, um, you can manage the process. That's not that hard. And from a caretaking side of things, it is just a process. Just it's a Monday to Sunday or Monday to Friday. This is what we need to do. You can bolt some training on there and you can tuck people in. So I think not having actual management rights experience is not anywhere near as big a problem as having former bad management rights experience. So yeah, so, it, it, um, so in theory, yes, they can. It's a bloody dangerous thing to do though, would be my, so when we...
No, so well, the seller absolutely has to pay for the legal and administrative costs. That's 100% set out in the legislation. We do sometimes have issues with... The seller doesn't have a choice. The seller does not have a choice. So the Act says the body corporate can get legal advice. The Act says the body corporate can recover its legal and administrative costs. The, the contract, the management rights contract, says the seller must pay those costs. So the seller doesn't have a choice. If they want the deal to happen, they must pay those costs. Sometimes we have issues with respect to these professional consultants that come in. You know, there might be a $1,800 assessment fee. Um, where I've got to with that is in a legal vacuum, um, it's up to the seller to prove to the body corporate satisfaction that the buyer can do the job. If the body corporate wants to engage third parties to assess that, it's up to the seller to pay those costs. So um, that's where it gets to. Yep. Um, well, that's, that's not a question of whether they have to pay the cost, that's a question about whether the costs were reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. But they have to pay the costs. No. And you want to make sure, hopefully, that for whatever reason that caused that grief, you have a different lawyer next time round, you take a bit more control of the process via your body corporate manager. No. Well, no, and what we do now with sellers is we will be communicating with them once we get towards, so the, the typical management rights process still is figures, legals, finance, and then body corporate approval. Once we get unconditional on due diligence, provided everyone's done their job properly, the buyer is going to get finance. It's just a matter of how long it takes. Um, at that stage, we engage with our seller clients and say, now's the time to think about what the body corporate's going to do with legal advice. Sometimes, like we know, I mean, and we get referrals from body corporate managers as well, but of course we can't do it when we're involved in the transaction. So we know sometimes which body corporate manager is going to send work to which lawyer, and sometimes we'll try to get in front of the body corporate manager via the client to suggest it doesn't go to a place that might cause us trouble, but you can't control that sometimes. That's just one of those... Um, no, no. You're in, you're, uh, sorry, the question was can you cap the fee? Your question of nine grand, I don't know what it went into that. Um, and in terms of capping fees, no. The body corporate's entitled to recover its reasonable costs. So the question is what's reasonable? Exactly, so uh, absolutely. So where it gets to, um, you know, sometimes we'll have sellers, uh, we had one, um, you know, the body corporate lawyer quoted us, I think about two grand, because we always ask, and it came in at about four. Um, I rang the lawyer again, mate said, mate, what happened here? He said the committee was a nightmare. Okay, um, but we got the approval. So, and I said to the client, look, the reality is that we're talking about, you know, and even allowing for a little bit of extra to and fro, maybe it's 1,500 bucks more than what, he, what, what it should have been. The reality is by the time you want to have a fight over it, you're going to spend more on me arguing it when the reality is you can settle and be gone because one of the things we absolutely have to do is draw a check on settlement for the costs. You can't not draw a check because then you don't settle. So at that stage, it becomes a commercial decision to just cut and move away. And what I would say is that in three months' time, you won't even remember it. That's always the case. In the heat of the moment, when everything's hot and heavy and it's just the stress of it all, understand how everyone gets upset. But if you, and what I always say to clients, is that you've got the ability to challenge legal fees for 12 months after the event. How about we settle it, and then in three months' time, if you want to have a go at them, come back and shout and we'll have a look at it then. And no one ever does. You know, and as much as that, I suppose that for me is the pragmatic commercial part of me in terms of there's no point charging clients 1,500 bucks to argue over 1,500 bucks. Just doesn't make sense. And everyone forgets about it. Frank, the ideal time to have that interview with a new buyer with a committee in a nice situation interview really at the last minute. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so the traditional, um, and there's, I could have put that in the handouts there, which I haven't. So there's a traditional, the traditional management rights process is get the buyer unconditional and then meet the committee. Um, subject to where you're at, like we've got one at the moment where the due diligence sort of produced some minutes where there was some friction. And so our client said, working for the buyer, said, stop, I want to meet these guys before I do anything else to see what it actually is. Is it personality? Is it performance? Is it something else? So, um, and, and where it gets to is there's, there's always been a, um, 
a fear, and sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's not, in terms of if you go and tell your committee even that you're on the market, they're going to be watching you like a hawk and start to be a little bit skittish about everything and all that sort of stuff. To me, um, I don't think there is a hard and fast rule. It comes back to, in terms of communication with your committee, the horror story of this one is a uh, big holiday building on the Gold Coast. We're acting for the seller. Uh, the committee comes to our clients and says, are you selling? No, 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 not at all. And then it's like, well, what's this? <laughs> Which isn't helpful, you know what I mean? It's just, um, yeah, sorry. So I think subject to where your relationship is with them, I think sometimes it's worth bringing them into the tent earlier in the piece and saying, look, you know, um, we've been here X number of years we're selling, you know, again, for the same reasons that people shift property. You know, we're going back to New Zealand, we've got a business opportunity in Victoria, whatever it might be. We've had enough, we've been doing this for six years, whatever it is. We'll let you know when we've got a buyer, we'll go through the process, we'll make sure that they're not complete idiots. We'll do our best to make sure that's the case um, and we'll let you know as we go. Um, but in, and in terms of interviewing, I think from a buyer's perspective, um, you, I think you're gonna be pushing uphill to try to change the process to meet the committee the moment the contract's signed, unless there's a history of dispute. And even um, sometimes, you know, like not all, like there's lots of militant things that go on from time to time. You've got people that for whatever reason say, there's no, I don't want management rights, which is insane. But there's the better committees which say, we do want management rights, but we just don't want you as the manager. So you go find us a buyer and we will serve up to them a top up with an agreement and all that sort of stuff, if you present someone that doesn't have two heads. So in that case, then absolutely, you sign a contract and the first thing you do is the interview. But I think from a pure buyer's perspective, if you went around making offers saying, I'll buy it at your price, but I wanna meet the committee the day after I sign the contract, you're gonna to struggle to get a deal across the line. So probably where I get to is you're best off getting through figures because if we're gonna see an issue at the moment, it's in figures, which is always the case. We still had one the other day where the bloody vendor included GST as income, but didn't have it as expense. It's just really. Um, <laughs> And that was 25 grand. So massive renegotiation. Anyway, so that's where the cropper will come. Um, and then if the due diligence produces a whole heap of minutes that look scary, at that stage it's, whoa, let's have a look. That's, I think, probably where it gets to. Yeah, Frank. Um, just a, a question. Um, I think it's a gray area that most places would probably want a, a clear, clear direction on. Um, when they have a situation where they you buy buy management rights and there's no set office hours, yeah. When you've got a letting and management agreement, and you're looking after the common area and things like that, it's very hard to be in two places at once. You get called away to an owner, you get called away to a job, or whatever it may be, or you're doing the work that needs to be done to manage the common area. Um, the office is not attended all the time by mm. one person. So hence your wife comes into the picture and is part of the letting agreement too and mm. you're a two team show. Yep. But when it says in the contract, no set office hours, but we chose to maintain the same hours as the previous managers, which is 8.30 to 4.30. But we put the sign up, we're only three steps away in the first unit on the same floor as the office. And we're contactable by phone, we're contactable by um, the reception intercom. And at times that it's not a, um, the body corporate chairman doesn't approve of that. He thinks, seems to think that the office has got to be maintained from 8.30 till 4.30 every day. Yeah. And it's not to be sort of left alone by itself. But we don't, I don't get paid enough money. No, and so, so you don't have office hours. No. There's, there, oh, cool. Well, my question to the chairperson would be why? What possible need is there for us to sit here in an office from 8.30 to 4.30, Monday to Friday, that cannot be dealt with by another means? So office hours started way back in the day before we had mobile phones, before we had emails. I mean, I used to drive to Brisbane from the Gold Coast to do stamps office and titles office lodging, I had a beeper. You know, if they wanted me to ring the office because someone had forgot something, it would be call office and have to find a public phone and get my 30 cents and ring them. <laughs> so that's, that's where office hours came from. But for me, and you're right, if you're doing caretaking, you're actually not in the office. 
You should be out and about doing whatever it is you're doing. If you're doing paperwork, you can do that at any given time of the day. From a letting perspective, that has nothing to do with the body corporate. That's about the services you offer to your individual owners and how you manage your tenants. So I think for me, best practice, obviously, is having tenants pay all their rent online. But if you have the odd numpty that wants to come in and pay you cash, then we, we do cash deposits from 10.30 till 12.30 on a Tuesday morning, and that's when you can come and do it. So um, my response to your chairperson would be, what are you missing by not having us in the office? And to me, where the industry needs to get to, and I probably covered that a little bit, is you're a professional service provider. Like to me, you're no different in that sense to a doctor or a lawyer. Whereas if you want to make an appointment to catch up, let me know and I'll be there at 10.30. You don't walk into my office and say, is Frank available? I need him for an hour. No, because I'm off doing whatever I'm doing. I'm down here doing this. And you should be the same. So, so my question to him is, that's cool, but why? What are we not doing that you think needs to be done, that can't be handled the way in terms of booking appointments, by email or otherwise? Yeah, that's not acceptable to him. Well, that's, that, then that's not the answer to the question. The answer is why? You're telling me it's not acceptable, but why? What is not being delivered? He expects me to be in the office the whole time but the body corporate do not pay me for the hours to maintain the office. Well, exactly. But there is a, they have the luxury of my wife being able to attend the office from 8.30 to 4.30 or be contactable by three steps away from yeah. the ground floor unit, yeah. which is what we do. Yeah. And, and that's not just one day a week, that's seven days yeah, a week. That's, so that's rubbish. 24-7 and he expects me to be by the phone the whole time. And they even have, I get so many what do you call it, phantom phone calls, I dare say many of the others have the same, where they're checking on me to see how quick I answer the phone. <laughs> and no one answers it. the cool. other end, but the same number keeps coming up. Well, to me, that's a fight you need to have because you're going to have to need to manage their expectations back. And I say to people, I'm contactable 24-7. You can ring and leave a message or you can send me an email. <laughs> that's no problem. And I will get back to you. If you send me an email, particularly, I'm good at that. Yeah, well, we have all the, you know, have all the well, I think you've, you've got to start to reset their expectations because that's rubbish behaviour. Well, we're, we're not, I'm not paid enough money no. to have an... I, I said to him, well, we had a secretary the first 12 months because we were learning the business. Yeah. But after that, when we went on the principal interest line, we realised we couldn't afford a secretary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the banks were taking all the money. So what happened was they, had, they were spoiled because I had a, a yep. secretary there, you know, six days a week, 8.30 till 4.30. And they expect that same sort of um, interaction, I suppose, to walk past the office and see someone sitting there the whole time, like a garden gnome. Yeah. So, um, that's it. And that's enough anyway, yeah. thanks. But you need, to, yeah, you need to reset their expectations. Yeah, he's given candy to the baby. Yeah. The candy back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pop one at the back here. <laughs> Thank you. It's on. Hello, Frank. That's not really working, Scott, the microphone. It's on, but, yeah. Frank, just a different scenario, if I could, please. Um, your opinion, please. Some body corporates control or own their own management rights, as you'd be well aware, and employ people to either supervise or do certain jobs around the building, and they get the letting business in return for those services. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are traditionally large agreements that keep referring to BCCM conditions for disputes and all of those sorts of things, but can you just maybe talk a little bit to me about... So you're talking Carmel by the sea? No, I'm not. Okay. No? <laughs> yeah. um, just where, where do the, the rights and the legality sit for the, for the person there in regards to maybe... You know, body corporate's all powerful in this circumstance with a 30-day notice, etc., etc. Cool. So um, I suppose the question really is about bodies corporate self self managing, for a better phrase. So if you go to the poster child for the Unit Association, which is Carmel by the Sea, where they ran down a standard module agreement to zero, um, what they did then was go and tender the caretaking agreement, and what they said is that they would deliver a bunch of lettings. So the caretaking agreement you do for nothing, and you earn your money from the letting. So to me, um, they. That was upheld, that, that approach was upheld at the Commissioner's Office 
It should have been appealed, in my view, but the circumstances of the manager where they'd been caught smoothing returns via leasebacks and that sort of stuff didn't give them the ability to go and do that. Because to me, what a body corporate is prohibited from doing under the Act is charging a fine premium or consideration for the granting of agreements, and effectively what that has done in Carmel is exactly that. And the other thing that I don't think, maybe they do know, I don't know, but what's happening at Carmel by the Sea is effectively all of the letting owners are subsidising all of the non-letting owners for the provision of the caretaking services, because no one works for free. So, and I don't know why they haven't wised up to that yet. You know, if the body corporate's all about reducing expenses, clearly the cost of the caretaking is being built into the revenue from the letting, so the letting owners are subsidising everyone else, um, which is insane. So how that's going, I don't know. Um, but, and this is one of the reasons why, from a management rights perspective, you need to keep sh make sure your agreements are topped up. Because uh, if you've only got four or five years to run, a body corporate can legitimately try not to top the agreements up and run it down to zero. And once a management rights agreement expires, what you've got then is a rent roll and potentially a unit. You don't have to caretake in salary and the body corporate's at liberty to go and do whatever it wants to do with um, the caretaking functions, be it employ someone or otherwise. So we, and one of the other things from a legislative perspective is a body corporate can't sell management rights. So there's no incentive for a body corporate financially to run it down for a windfall gain would be the magic words that um, some people would use. But if management rights haven't existed previously, a body corporate can sell them. So we've actually acted for a couple of body corporates selling management rights and creating them out of nothing when they didn't exist previously. So that's the opposite of what you're talking about with body corporates going to self-management, where body corporates were creating a management structure because they didn't want to do all the stuff themselves at a committee level. So um, I think that theory comes and goes, and probably every um, five or six years there's a proposed legislative review into management rights. Um, you can go back through probably to the 80s, the first white or green paper as it was at that point in time. Um, it always appears and then nothing comes of it. And the reason why, I think, is um, probably because the management rights industry is now too big to unscramble. And the other thing is that with the management rights industry, the banks probably own the majority of it. The reality is if, if you tip in 20, 30, 40% of the equity, the bank tips in the rest. So if you were going to do something that dramatically affected the value of management rights businesses by legislative intervention, that would have a dramatic effect on their value, which would absolutely affect the banks. And that will never happen. So, um, so yeah, so bodies corporates can absolutely go towards self-management. Um, I think, and I get this from time to time, where you, know, you might have a committee that says, don't vote yes to a top up because we want to see what's going to happen in 2027 when this agreement expires, because we want to then go and look at the pricing. So, well, why don't wait till then, do it now. Go and price all of the things that the manager's doing now. The pool, the gardens, the grounds, the facility management, the lift maintenance, the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then put a price on the administrative, and the administrative nature of the things and the supervision of things and compare it today. I've never had anyone do that. Uh, because I think in the vast majority of cases, if the manager does their job properly and effectively and communicates their value, they will do a better job than a whole bunch of individual contractors left in the hands of a volunteer committee to try to do it. Because the strata managers aren't going to do it. It's not their job to run around and get on site and do all that sort of thing. They'll administer the paperwork afterwards, but there will need to be someone on site to run all the contractors around and make sure they show up and make sure they do all the things they want to do. And while you might have an interested committee at a particular point in time, at some stage there won't be an interested committee and then what happens? The fire keeps ringing. Yep. So, um, so yeah, I think like to me, management rights is still a model that works and don't get me wrong, there's still some elements of it at times that could be tweaked. And yes, there's still some bodies corporates that get stuck with agreements that don't necessarily reflect what should go on. I mean, we're dealing with one at the moment where clearly uh, the lawyer has pressed print on a prior version for a high rise and it refers to 40 million things that aren't there and not the stuff that should be. So we're now negotiating with that committee trying to sort out, well, let's try to get something that accurately reflects what needs to happen. Um, 
but yeah, and that's, you know, I don't know how many management rights businesses there are in Queensland. I mean, you've obviously got a swag of clients. The best number's probably somewhere two and a half to 3,000, but yep. there's no publicly available database of them, so no one knows. We have about 1,200. 1,200 clients. Is, is what clients. you've got? Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a swag of them. So yep. you might have a third of the market if those numbers are right. Well, hopefully, hopefully more. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. It, it's, and, and the other thing that affects running agreements down, of course, is tenure. It's all well and good for a committee to say, we want a choice, but it's like your choice doesn't come around until 2042. Everyone will have moved on by then. And that's the reality of the position nine times out of ten. So I hope that's answered the question. Let's take one or two more questions, yep, Frank, sure. and if people want to ask afterwards. I'll and so Amy and I will be hanging around. So Amy's at okay. the back and I'll be at the front. So we'll take one here and one up the back here. Okay. Just speak nice and loudly. Okay. Hi, Frank. Uh, thanks for your uh, time and uh, uh, speech. Yes. And uh, we, we would like to know... Uh, is it okay? Yeah, it's kept on your own. Uh, uh, what shall we do the uh, the uh, you know the exercise the option when and uh, no. Cool. Um, so the question is when you should exercise your option. The the answer is when you're required to under your agreement. So what you need to do is go and have a look at your management rights agreement. And sometimes, normally the way they work is they've got to be exercised somewhere three months, usually three months before the term actually expires. Sometimes you can do it, there's a window of between three and six months and sometimes it's just no less than three months. So um, you, in theory, some agreements you could have an option due in 2027 and you could exercise it today. So um, if you're not sure, just flick me your agreements and I'll tell you. Because it's a, it's, a it's a finite date in those agreements and each one's different. If you forget to exercise your option, you don't have a management rights agreement. That's, that's very bad. <coughs> yep. So, I would really like to have your opinion between the standard and the accommodation modules. Yep. And we asked for a magic wand. Are there any um, terms that one could use in a body corporate committee meeting to persuade them that it's worth moving from standard to accommodation so that you yep. can continue to get the finance yep. because unlike others in our, in our business, I don't think we would be able to afford to go to capital. Cool. So um, the first thing, so the question relates to moving from standard to accommodation module. So if you want to Google something, Google a BCCM19. So that's the statutory form that you've got to send whenever you're going to change modules. The, um, and that sets out the differences between the modules. But the reality was when they were first drafted, which is 97, in theory, the accommodation module was going to apply more to sort of short-term rental buildings and standard was going to be everything else. Over time, they've morphed back to being effectively the same thing. There, there really is very little difference between them, other than the fact that um, under the accommodation module, the committee, in a sense, has a tiny bit more control over decision making in terms of accountability to owners and the rest of it, and of course then term for management rights agreements. So if you want to change modules, um, the first thing you need is the lots need to be predominantly accommodation lots, which means, and this has been litigated, effectively more than 50% of them are rented or available for rent. So if you've got more than 50% owner occupiers, you can't get there anyway. Um, after that, uh, the reality is that um, probably where I get to in terms of clients changing modules is that um, what it encourages is a longer term and more stable system of management for the building. That's the pitch. Um, and that, to, to take advantage of it, to change modules, you actually need to have a new management rights agreement afterwards. You can't simply vary your existing agreement to top it up. Um, so that normally then opens the door for a conversation with the body corporate about what the management rights agreements look like, which is usually the caretaking duties, remuneration, and that sort of thing. Um, so probably there's not as much activity in that space as I think there sometimes could be, um, but it is, you want to do it, you don't want to do it if you're taking the committee on, is my experience. You want to do it where you have good relationships with your owners and the pitch really, like even topping up agreements and that sort of stuff, and even Gallery V, the perfect world is not getting into a legal argument about what Section 70 means and all that sort of stuff. It's, this is what I'm asking, can you please vote yes? And if your relationships are good, people will just do it. 
And that's certainly where we've got to with Gallery B is um, we actually lost one the other day where the body corporate got the wrong legal advice a week out from the meeting. But other than that, we've got every single one across the line. And that sometimes has been me having a conversation with a dictatorial chairperson, but the majority of the time has been owners or our clients saying to bodies corporates, the banks are making us do this, can you please vote yes? So, if you, so I think, and owners react to that, no one needs the detail. And it's, so it's not a legal sell, it's a relationship sell. So that's where I get to with those things more often than not, but probably expect to have a conversation around a new agreement and that's normally then the sell for the body corporate is yes, we're going to a longer form of management and, and the other thing is not necessarily going straight for 25 years, it might be going for 15. But that's better than 10 from a financing perspective and, and if we're doing a longer term agreement then we should have a look at the duties and make sure it's updated and take into account all the things we need to do and you do a time and motion study and you have a rock star schedule and away you go. And that then is the sell to the body corporate is there's more accountability and that, that helps if you've got an agreement that is just saying mow the lawns as required, maintain the pool, because you bring more specificity to it, then that justifies what it is that you're getting paid and also justifies the fact that we're now in control of what this management structure is going to be for the next 15 years. Could I just say quickly, Frank, that that's absolutely true. What he says and what everything else he said today is exactly true. And if you follow that information that he gives you, Everything works just like that. I've just had mine done, a top up, the bell we did, and people just said, just as Frank said then, that's what he proposed to them. And they all vote yes, because they love to see me out in the garden, they love to see me <laughs> out in the pool. Is it well, Frank, paying someone to give Yeah, no, give look, all these plants, it's unreal, yeah. Free advertising. Free advertising. Well, <laughs> Free lunch coming your yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll get my wallet out now. Yeah. So a couple of things I just want to finish off. One of them is obviously thank you very much for your time, no, Frank. It's been you. an excellent um, session. Hopefully everyone's taken something out of it. One of the uh, comments was about educating yourself. Well, you've already done that today. You took the time out of your office to come and to, uh, listen to Frank, so you can tick that off. What's the next thing you're going to do? Let's start tomorrow and get on with it. A couple of things about the REI Master and REI Cloud software. There is the ability to add a document newsletter. You've got 10 days until the end of the month. Let's get on and get it done so you can attach it to all your owners. Um, obviously, that was one of the key points. The other is the spell check. There is a function in REI Master and REI Cloud where you can right click and it will spell check your email before you send it if you are sending it from the TUS and notes area of REI Master. So do that because things can be misinterpreted if you've got the wrong meaning. Okay, we've all been there previously. Last thing is, um, don't forget to say good day to my team as you walk out the door. There's a couple of trade stands. I'd love to meet you in person so they can put a face to a name. But at the end of the day, thanks again, Frank. Hope everyone had a great session. Nice. Thank you.